Welcome back to another episode of Graphic Content. We're back. It's uh, Dave and Jack. This week we have for you This One Summer by Jillian and Mariko Tamaki, cousins. I brought my copy as well. And we have Sticks Angelica, Bokiro by Michael Del Forge. Um, once again. De Forge. De Forge, excuse me. Once again this week, all the uh, creators are Canadian. Um, we'll start going on in Canada. Something's going on in Canada. Um, we'll start things off with this one. Summer came out in 2014. Um, I believe it is a huge award winner. It was a New York Times bestseller. It, I think it won that thing with the circle on it, like Holdicott or something. The Caldicott? Uh, yes. Or something, yeah. yeah I it, think won, it won the Caldicott, big one. a pretty prestigious illustration award for children's books. Yeah. And this is uh, it's it, it's content for like preteens teenagers and and up yes say. yeah uh, but that's not to say that adults will not enjoy it I, yeah i enjoyed it pretty immensely i thought it was really well done absolutely um it came out probably i remember i was teaching at the museum school in boston around the time that it had come out and um, I mentioned it to my students, and so my students were all really excited about it. There's just a lot of really lush art to look at. Um, I, I think uh, Jillian Tamaki, who is the uh, cartoonist, just really does a really um, stellar job with expressions and um, anatomy. Like, it, it's one thing to look at a graphic novel where you could tell that, that somebody has a real love for drawing, and, and Jillian Tamaki certainly mm -hmm. does. And the collaboration between the two cousins is kind of interesting. Um, I kind of wonder like how the story took shape between the two of them. Um, I've, I've never not really done any sort of writer-illustrator collaborations myself. I always wonder about those kinds of relationships. And especially because the story is so personal, um, I have to wonder like what um, who contributed to what and what their process was, uh, but I'm sure I can go online and find the podcast mm. or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the artwork kind of reminds me a bit of Blueberries for Sal or Make Way for Ducklings. Oh, yeah. uh, Robert McCloskey, um, who is a pretty famous children's book illustrator due to its, it's blue. yeah, the uh, limited color palette mm -hmm. and the attention to realism and uh, the area in which they are in. Um, I, it's never really stated what state they're in. Um, I might be projecting a little bit due to my personal location, but it reminded me of Cape Cod. Um, yeah. One potential clue, if that were the case, if I were to your eyes, the name of the store is called Brewster, the Brewster store, which is a town in Cape Cod. No. The name of the it town is called Owego. But you know, it's vacation land USA. I suppose yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's it's like it's a resort really town, sleepy mm -hmm. resort town. Yeah. The, the kind that in, especially in New England, there's a mm -hmm. ton of them. They all spring yeah. to life once and the weather gets good and tourists flock and, and people that do like yeah. timeshares flock to their timeshares. And it's very cerebral and it's about the time in one's life when you're no longer a child but you're not really a teenager just yet either. Yeah. You're kind of uh, beginning to com comprehend the complexities of life. You're beginning but, to comprehend the uh, imperfections of life. Yeah. Um, there's if, some if pretty... I, if I remember um, how I worded it um, to my students, I, I described that as the cusp between adulthood and childhood yeah. when talking about this book. Which can be very awkward and um, uh, unpleasant at times. Uh, there's one character, for example, named Matt, who is the, uh, the oaf of the dud at the convenience store who's consistently wearing pretty offensive t-shirts and hats um, and is pretty misogynistic. And this is early exposure to these young girls who are probably maybe experiencing these things for the yeah. first time. Or yeah. So the the so they're so the main characters are this uh, pair pair of girls who um, they're they meet up at this summertime resort. So they're kind of resort friends. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I don't mean like a resort like uh, anything too engineered. Like it's a really sleepy town and people mm -hmm. just go there and spend most of the time at the beach pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. going on hikes and, yeah. and Rose is Rose is the main character. Right. Right. right and right. Wendy is her best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rose is there with her family, her mother and father. There's some tension there. 
uh, between their relationships. So and already yeah. there's there's some some drama built into. And we won't spoil anything. The route, the root of the tension, which is kind of the story itself, We're trying to figure out what it is. But continue, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's all kind of related to the setting. Mm -hmm. um, the the setting uh, holds a lot of tension for the parents. Um, so Wendy and Rose, best friends, they meet, they go to the beach. Um, Wendy is slightly older, so she's having these uh, very preteen experiences, uh, uh, looking onto the adult world, um, seeing some dramas take place that the local teenagers are, are experiencing uh, and kind of just publicly having, um, as well as developing her own crush on one of the local teens. Yeah, who's very flawed. <laughs> As, uh, as teenagers are. As teenagers are. <laughs> and Wendy uh, is kind of able to go in and out of all of that, um, all, of, all of those situations, uh, the way that kids do. You know, as a kid, you can kind of go and sneak around and mm -hmm. do your own thing for a while. So you definitely do. I, I have an appreciation for the kid's eye view of, yeah, yeah. of the world as depicted in this book. Because it seems like the, the adults, be them the 16-year-old dud and older, it's almost as if they're invisible like they and the kids get snippets of these conversations and they have like a puzzle They have to put together mm -hmm. what the heck's going on. Yeah um, But because they're children everything is somewhat censored to them, which is Insulting to them because she's like I'm not a kid, you know yeah. like but it's like once again You're in that place and uh, you get the sense the adults don't really even know if they're kids or not yet you know anymore and they're watching horror movies. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, it's like they it's have this funny. flirtation with adult content the whole time. Like a horror movie, uh, it's like one of those things. I, I feel like it was a really good um, decision for them to use kind of the, the horror movie rentals as a window, in, one of the windows into the adult world. And it's yeah. like this forbidden thing that's, a, that has, that's, um, that's still so forbidden at their age that they're sneaking around and watching these DVDs on their mm -hmm. laptop. And they're they're horrified by them. I guess yeah. I don't know. It's implied that they're watching some gory stuff. It's Nightmare on Elm Street, Jaws, <laughs> and uh, Friday the Thirteenth. And it's all a little too much for yeah. them still. So they're yeah. still kids. Um, and I'll, I'll point out that Rose is really smart. She's really observant, and I think it's telling that the artwork is extremely observant too. It's yeah. very natural. It's like it's clear that there is a connection. It's a hidden autobiography somewhere in this because mm -hmm. the character is just too observant for the art to be simultaneously as observant, you know, <laughs> in reflection, you know. And she's very, she picks up on a lot. And I think a lot of the parents don't realize how much she's picking up. And the kids at the convenience store don't realize how much she's picking up. Yeah, there's, there's this one panel in particular that w uh, really spoke to me about like uh, really capturing a character. It's where the character of Rose, here it is. It's uh -huh. where she's um, dancing. It's kind of a time-lapse panel. It's beautiful stuff. And uh, yeah. Rose is dancing around. It's a, it's a double-page spread here. She's dancing around a, a kitchen table. And you have Wendy um, sitting. They're both kind of enjoying this really free moment of listening to music kind of in a very pure way, uninhibited. You know, uh, Wendy's just doing like a wacky dance, not caring at all what anybody in the world thinks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the time lapse quality, um, you know, compositionally, it's really interesting. And um, you get a sense that, that Julian, uh, as an illustrator, really knew these characters. Yeah. Um, I, I got that through, um, through this particular spread. I really loved Wendy as a character, too. Um, I think my favorite part with her is when she calls out Rose for consistently using sexist terms that she heard the uh, boys in the uh, convenience store say. Yeah. And that made me think that I think a part of growing up is having opinions and having things that you believe in. And she's beginning to flirt with that. And you could see how difficult it was because she's like, uh-oh, this is one of my best friends. Yeah, but I strong, calling me out on this. But I'm strongly, you know, but I disagree with this. And I mean, and it's just- Wendy has some pretty progressive parents. Like she she mm -hmm. has a, a, like parents with really strong political views. And yeah. um, you only meet one of them, right? She's, she's yeah. older. Um, um, and like, uh, you know, she's the, uh, I think she, it, she she does. There's, yeah, like it's it's alluded to. Like she does, like she sells like 
vegetarian books or yeah. something or something like that. Yeah, yeah I so can't remember exactly. Like a hippie progressive. She's a little crunchy. To, yeah. To Wendy's upbringing, and and that allows Wendy to um, speak out when Rose is picking up and using a lot of the sexist uh, terminology that she's overhearing from the local teenagers. So yeah. So and then so that that kind of builds a little tension between those characters and then so yeah there's tension throughout the book between the different sets of characters including the best friends Wendy and Rose and um, it, it it's like you know like like any good story it gets really really tested um, and and then you're just waiting to see like is is any of the tension going to be relieved at all um, so structurally you know I really I I appreciated that in this book. Mm -hmm. It was really well observed, um, and it's just really a well observed bro book. Like oh, there was yeah. just something it, like about about the preteen years, about um, summertime. Yeah, like there was especially at the beginning when they first get there. There's just some really really sleepy panels, like where nothing happens. The way that when the first few days of a summer vacation, where mm -hmm. you're just really doing nothing and you're cool with just lying in bed for a few hours, mm -hmm. you know, reading a book and going to the beach for I, a few hours. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but when I was reading this, it was eerily relatable, you know? Uh, it, it, I'm not a 13-year-old girl, and I wasn't <laughs> at any point, um, but, you know, I that vacation and that time of life, I just really could relate to, you mm -hmm. know? Like, it's the, that, that time in my life is so vivid in my mind um, particular, you know, and it's these conundrums they find themselves in, you know, looking up to people slightly older who are imperfect, mm -hmm. who are like, you know, drinking and like your parents having a fight and not really knowing what the heck it's about and not being told. Right. And, and then know, suddenly one of those parents isn't there. Yeah. Or yeah. It, you know, it's gone, going away for right. a few days and uh -huh. that, that, that wasn't part of the plan. And yeah. You know, and uh, just trying to navigate. And, and, and just, yeah, just like all these things happening around you and you can't really do anything about it. No. You know, and it's good. It's good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's no surprise it's an award winner to me. I, I re recommend this to anyone, you know? Yeah, it, I think it's a good, um, to anybody that isn't really into comics, I think it's a good comics, especially, it's a good comic or graphic novel that uh, it might help bridge the gap, might be a good first graphic novel for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it reads really well. It's meant for a young adult audience, which might, you know, ease in any apprehensions that anybody might have about comics. Mm -hmm. um, and to everybody else, uh, you know, enjoy the story, enjoy the art. Yeah. Yeah. So should we move on? Let's. Let's move on. Let's move on. On to something completely different. Completely, <laughs> completely different. Uh, well, In some ways. Really. I mean, like, it's, it yes and no. Place, yeah. um, nature. some seasons. In nature. Uh, limited color palette. A limited, yeah. yeah uh, it, the, Canadian author. The, uh, I, I would say the big switch is in ooh. art style. Um, and, uh, you know, the word genius, I think, is thrown around a lot. And, but Delforge... Especially with Michael Delforge. Um, yeah, but um, he's... This is the avant-garde, I think. I think I'm looking at it, of, of this medium in particular. Um, his s style kind of jumps around in a flawless way between things that are iconic, things that are really abstract, and things that are... Re ob based on observation drawing, I think. Yeah. His his perspective shifts rapidly between things that are two dimensional. Looks like it could be from like the Adventures of Link, to <laughs> uh, backgrounds that look like textile patterns to three dimensions, um, and it's all done in a way that looks like an airplane illustration. So you can really read it. Mm -hmm. You know. Like oftentimes abstract things are incredibly illegible. Like but a schematic or something? Yeah, 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 or just like I have no idea what's going on. But this is extremely abstract, but I know what's going on the whole time yeah. simultaneously. It's, uh, he's, and this is, um, so I guess it's important to point out that this was originally collected as a webcomic weekly. And so it comes. So it is in that format. Right. Yeah. It's like a, for comic book, uh, you know, uh, people. 
it's like a Sunday strip in the newspaper. Yeah, it and, looks um, like, like there are about eight panels each, although he does some four panels. Yeah, occasionally, panels. right. And I find it that he was really experimenting with the form here. Um, the form, the, the sequence between panels changes. Sometimes it's like literally just a poem with some abstract lines behind it over yeah. six panels. Other times it's just a collection of drawings of like the animal's favorite foods. Um, well, okay, so the main character. Yeah, is, I'm, I'm going all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. That, that was all true. Really great, um, <laughs> like description of, of kind of what DeForge is doing here. The main character, uh, the title character, is Styx Angelica, mm -hmm. who lives out in this forest on her own. A very independent character. Uh, she uh, a former Olympian, I believe. Yeah, she's um, she's pretty larger than life, hence being a folk hero. She's like a, a the the daughter of a politician, a mm -hmm. poet, a scholar, a sculptor, a governor general, entrepreneur, line cook, headmistress, mountie, columnist, mm -hmm. libertarian cellist. She's also an arrogant, self obsessed force who wills herself on the floor and fauna around her. And that's that's as accurate a description as you can get. That's right from the back of the book. Um, so. So it's a, it is an interesting character, not a wholly likable one. Um, there's actually some of the animals, animal characters that are around her, maybe are a little more likable. But it's not really so much about likability. I think um, mm -hmm. at at times, especially at the beginning, it feels a lot like a stream of consciousness narrative that DeForge um, doesn't really may, maybe you know had a, a basic idea of what he was doing, and then he's just kind of running with it. Um, so I get a sense of. Uh, of that with with yeah. his character. I read an interview with him and he stated that if he's not challenging himself He feels like he's he's not interested in doing it. Yeah, um, and you see a, a ton of experimentation here I, I, And it, as a result it goes in insane directions like there's a battle royale-ish hunting range Where the main character is hunting down that little girl with an X on her um, there's a uh, there's the Lisa Hanawalt character who's a moose, yeah. Which is so kind Lisa of Lisa Hanawalt is a cartoonist who is also uh, I guess she's also Canadian. Yeah. Okay. As Lisa Hanawalt, who is a moose with a a, a, a woman's body, mm -hmm. and then uh, later on Michael DeForge comes on as a character as well, yeah. named Michael DeForge. So there's there's some interesting and uh, you know I think with any other artist it would have come off in jokey but it I don't I don't really feel like it's an in joke or anything at all I feel like um, he's just some people I mean some people may not even notice it unless you're like really into the insider baseball game of comic books you know yeah you're just like, picking it up he, he's doing something interesting with the recognizability of names it's not not I wouldn't call it celebrity I just think like recognizability and maybe paying homage to another cartoonist um, and and doing something with his own character, maybe an extension of some sort of fantasy life that he envisions for himself. Which um, I, the more you, I read Michael DeForge's comics, I kind of get the sense that that uh, the the fantasy realm is where he's happiest. And mm -hmm. he, he, yeah, he's a really good world builder. And and, and, to, and to go further into that, there is a pair of geese, and in one of the geese, a, a mosquito lives in the house in his head. Um, at certain point, Del Forge is a reporter, and he's reporting on Sticks Angelica, but she's a hermit, and so she punches him into the ground and gets stuck in the ground. Right. And then uh, grass starts growing out of mm -hmm. him. And when he gets out of the ground, um, his body is so weak that it's just floating around in the He's sky. He's like papery. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it, that kind of alludes to what he was doing with bodies. Um, with his tree book, big kids. Big kids. I've only read Ant Colony in this. Yeah, yeah. and where the the characters there are literal trees, and then I also read like uh, some other like short, uh, paneled comics where yeah. uh, characters of, heart, of of characters of his are, are trees. Yeah. So there is something to like the human body um, being um, referenced as uh, you know pretty directly as trees and as plant life. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a reoccurring kind of thing with him. He's like a more surreal Wes Anderson because the problems yeah. that the characters are having are somewhat mundane and focus around the human condition. But the aesthetics of the book as a whole are kind of 
not candy, yeah, a little candy coated, kind of cutesy, but also completely surreal right. and yeah. bizarre and unsettling sometimes, mm-hmm. you know? Like, mm-hmm. um, like you could write off what looks like a really cute illustration, and, but, but you really have to read the dialogue to figure out what's going mm-hmm. on. Um, I wouldn't write off any of his illustrations. I'm, I'm just yeah. saying, like anybody it's, who's it's not, interesting. Who's coming into I, this brand new. Yeah, you know, I would. I, w- I wish I had read it um, in its original format as a web comic, mm-hmm. and with one week between strips, because as a whole book, I kept on expecting there to be some kind of like connection between them a little bit more. Yeah. But I think it's purposely a little loose. This book is about experimentation. Yeah. Experimentation of the form. Um, I'll go out on a limb and I'll, I'll say it like I think that the art is the strong suit of this, you know? I mean, the characters are interesting and everything, but I'm more interested in how much he plays with the form in this book. The way I encounter a lot of the older strips, like the E.C. Seeger's Popeye and mm-hmm. the uh, Floyd Godfordson's Mickey Mouse, is the Fantagraphic editions. And um, so, like these things that originally were published in strips, in daily strips and newspapers are, are now available collected all at once. So with the continuity strips like Popeye and Mickey Mouse and you know whatever ones that are out there, Crazy Cat, um, you know, you actually can follow the narrative pretty uh, closely, whereas you know, uh, a generation, two or three generations ago, the way that that was available, it was serialized, and it was like mini serialized on a daily basis. And hmm. So I, I, I kind of, a, I um, appreciate that reading of it, like knowing that these were done, um, were they published daily? I think it was weekly. Weekly? I think it was weekly. Yeah. I might be wrong, I don't know, I don't know. Knowing that they were put out that way, and the challenge for a cartoonist there is you have a beginning panel, you have an end panel, and you have to you have to make it interesting within, in, in this case, eight panels. And then the f- the further challenge is to is the larger narrative, you know. So so th- I I guess where I'm going with this is like uh, a, the, a cartoonist that takes on a, a, a continuity strip uh, has those challenges, mm-hmm. and I feel like uh, it adds another with DeForge. It adds like this layer of magic to yeah to and. To this really bizarre world that he's created, it, it adds a layer of otherworldliness to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think he's pushing the format in ways that nobody else is, in terms of just um, the aesthetic of it. Yeah, and it's, his stuff is just kind of fun to look at. Yeah. You kind of fall into. I will. In certain cases, like a single panel and I, I like will his say, drawing of an eel, of an electric eel, yeah. like that's that's just really good design. Oh I, yeah, yeah. I, I would wear that as a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I want that t-shirt. Right. Um, I will say that, um, you know, not to. I mean, it's it's not really fair to compare the two books from this week. Yeah. Because they're so different. But I was more satisfied with this in 2018, because. Sticks and Angelica is so fantastical, and I feel like my life right now is so fantastical, <laughs> and everything is so Ooh. surreal, you know, that cool. <laughs> that I kind of I'm more comforted towards the mundane at the moment, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like this is just so the like, mundane is fantasy for you. Well, I, I I just you know there's just like so much of life is looking at screens and looking mm-hmm. at like photoshopped memes. Right. It's like something like Sticks and Angelica is just like my normal life, you know, <laughs> like. It's like, <laughs> like I kind of like am comforted by nature, you okay. know. You know, it, it's like if art is food, I just kind of want something a little more leafy, a little less sugary. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right now, I'm not. It, it's just where I'm at right now. I hear you. you. Know? Yeah. But I, it's kind of neat to compare the two, you know. Like it's it, he's not very observational. I find some of his abstractions to f- be a little unnerving sometimes. Like when he draws a deer, but it has a fish eye, mm. just because. Your brain isn't expecting that. I suppose not. Yeah. Yeah, it's like something surreal. It's like when Dolly puts that lobster on a telephone, you know? It's just, I like it. I like being challenged. Um, It's just a different sensation. I see what you're saying. Yeah, Yeah. like stuff, like surrealist imagery, um, when you're looking at it in book form, can be a little too much. Um, Yeah, yeah. Or or maybe too much isn't the right term, but it, 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 it's unexpected in a way that um, for longer narratives, you know, maybe it makes it a little more unsettling compared to, 
you know, where you have more realistically rendered yeah. characters. And, and I'll admit I'm alone on this. Like, Adventure Time, like, people love Adventure Time. I just think it's, like, it creeps me out a little bit. <laughs> like, sometimes. Like. I, I'm not a fan of Adventure Time. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I have some friends that are, they were a few years ago. Um, yeah. I just don't like how they say dude all the time. It's, it's like, like a little dude, too cute. Yeah, dude. yeah. it's a little too self-aware. It's a little too self-aware, you know. Nobody says dude that much. And if <laughs> they do, they're like frat boys or something. Um, yeah. Why would you want to see a cartoon about frat boys? Anywho. And uh, on that. <laughs> and on that, uh, I, I think I think we're good for time. Um, uh -huh. What you reading? What are you reading uh, right now? Really quickly, what am I reading right now? I picked up... Um, X Men Grand Design, which I, I'm Ooh. currently not reading, but I am looking forward mm. to just getting a nice block of time where I could sit down with Ed Pisker's X Men Grand Design, the first volume. Cool. Yeah. I am reading um, by Rick Tominiso. Am I saying that right? I don't know. I'm oh, sorry. Rich. The guy who did Spy Seal. He did. Yep. He okay. now has a new comic coming out from Image called Dry County, huh. and it's like a. It's a like a, it's like a crime story set in Miami. It's like really understated. Cool. Really digging that. And as far as just book books, reading Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, The Dispossessed, oh, which right uh, right. she passed away earlier this year, I believe. Oh. And my Instagram blew up, and everyone who has really good taste was like, "Oh my god!" And they were grieving. Yeah. So like, I better read one of her books. And you know, it is awesome. So, I yeah, I've been thinking about um, getting some uh, audiobooks. She's great. Yeah. All all the books are great. Yeah. All these books are great. I'm oh, oh non-comic book I'm reading really uh, quick is uh, The Witches. It's mm. uh, non-fiction about uh, Salem, The Witches. Ooh. It's really good. Really good. Pick it up. Scary. Yeah, it's really scary stuff. Really Puritans. Not, not, not good people. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think that does it. So uh, I'm Dave. I'm Jack. Happy and reading. Take care. All right. See ya. Sweet. Cool. All right. In the bag. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll come out just about perfect.